My name is Hrayer and my family name is Jebedjan. I am an Armenian. I was born, raised and lived in Beirut, Lebanon. I was naturalized in the Republic of Cyprus. And now I am uh, living, and it's been for many years, I've been living and working in the, in the Gulf countries. Now, it's a bit complicated, I know. But let's move on. That's who I am. That's my name, and so on and so forth. First, before going on, I would like to say a very big thank you to all my colleagues in the American Bible Society for bringing us all together, this big group, Bible societies and non-Bible societies, partners in the ministry for this wonderful uh, gathering, conference, exchange of ideas, learning, and so on and so forth. So thank you very much, all of you. I know that there is a big crowd and I don't want to uh, address each one of you by name, those who have organized it, but a very big thank you for uh, every one of you. Now, I have a challenge. And let me tell you what my challenge is. I have 20 minutes. And my very dear friend, Harriet, is on the watch. <laughs> and she is calculating every second. I know that. So I have to do a little bit fast so that I can show our whole region, which can have so many mysteries, so many unknowns, so that you can have a clearer and a bigger picture of what we are trying to do in my part of the world. Before moving on, there are some terminologies that we need to agree on, which not necessarily is the same. When I say migrants, all of us can be migrant. Uh, for example, I left Lebanon and I moved to Cyprus, or I went to, uh, to, uh, to somewhere else. I can be a migrant. But in our context, in the Gulf context, migrants are the laborers, those who work in construction site, those who work in petrol stations, those who work as maids, the women. Those kind of laborers, we call them as migrants, whereas the teachers, the engineers, the doctors, the name it, professionals, they are all classified as expatriates. So when we talk about ministry among the migrants, we're talking about those kind of people. This is the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. It's a challenging region, with the exception of Iran and Israel, the rest are all Arab countries. The official language is Arabic and the religion is Islam. Christianity is a minority, but may I kindly remind you that the Christianity started from this part of the world. Okay, we can be my minority, but we started from this part of the world. Another thing, do you know there are several ways where the Muslims identify the Christians with? And one of the ways, they call us the people of the book. The people of the book. Now, the book is not a cookbook or something else. I hope we can agree on that, right? When they say the people of the book, they are talking about the Bible. So, I don't know how my other colleagues in the Middle East will look into these things, but I feel very proud. And I feel very happy with that to be called as the people of the book, because it's not any kind of a book. It is a book that really gives meaning to our lives. And this is what we stand for. It's for the book. This is not a geography lesson, so that you will know how far away our region is from Philadelphia. Where do I work in? This is the Gulf region. You can see Saudi Arabia, which is the big daddy and then all the other countries which are surrounding it. Now, we can call it Arabian Gulf. We can call it the Persian Gulf. So for the next two or three hours, I can talk to you about the differences, and then we will end up with nothing. <laughs> so the best will be, let's focus on the Gulf. But it's not the Mexican Gulf. It's the Arabian Peninsula. That's the Gulf. So we minister, as a Bible society, we are one Bible society which we work in seven countries. This setup is rather unique for our fellowship because we usually represent one country at a time. But in our case, because of so many socio-political and ge uh, geographical locations, we have grouped all uh, at, at this, uh, in, in, one, uh, in one region. It's the Magnificent Seven, right? So I uh, move around so that I can see that these seven countries will remain magnificent with Jesus, with the Word of God. Now, would you believe that this whole region was Christian once? Huh? 
They will, you will not believe, especially the big daddy, Saudi Arabia. Christian church uh, the, was there as early as the 3rd century AD. Unfortunately, with the Islam coming in at the 5th century, after the 9th century, it completely disappeared. Then it re-entered with the colonial era, with the Portuguese era, and then with the British. And eventually, Mission of Arabia, with the Reformed Church of America, they did a lot in establishing the Christian ministry in these Gulf countries. Whoever is interested with this whole story, I do have a uh, lecture on the YouTube. You can go at it. There are some exciting things there, but that's not the time to do it. So the church remained expectorate, and we're, we're going to see at it later on. These countries are all very rich in natural resources, <coughs> gas, oil, and so on and so forth. And that's the reason why they have uh, attracted a lot of foreigners to come and live in this part of the world. Now look at these statistics can give you an example. More than 120 different nationalities are living in this part of the world. And from the 50 million plus people, half of them are national, the rest are non-nationals. So out of these 25 million non-nationals, 15 million, one five, 15 million are migrant workers, one five. So they are coming from all different parts, uh, from primarily from Asia and from, uh, from Africa. You could see even in some of the countries like Qatar and the United Arab Emirates where the percentage goes up to even 90%. Migrant workers. These people come from India and from Africa. They come from different countries in, uh, in Asia. They come from different, with different languages. They come from different faith backgrounds. That can be Hindu, that can be Buddhist. And they come to the Gulf because they want to look for a better life. They come so that they can make some living and to send their money back home. And what is this living? 200 to $250 a month a salary. And sometimes they are paid regularly, sometimes they are not paid. Even the months can pass without even getting their salary. Uh, they don't have any medical insurance. So they are supposed to go back home once every two years and that sometimes has been deprived. So we end up having so many social, psychological and other uh, issues. They go to abuse, especially the women who work as base because we have a big number of women workers uh, in, in the Gulf. They go to addictions, depressions, loneliness, lack of medical help and so on and eventually suicide. Very sad. I am sure you have seen all these fascinating buildings in Dubai. Now, if you, have, if you do not know the other cities in the Gulf, most likely you have seen big buildings of Dubai. Such a charming city with all the malls, with all these things, and so on and so forth. That's what you see. But there is something behind these big buildings that you do not see. And what is that? It's these people these migrant workers. These are the people who are making those cities charming cities. But unfortunately, they do not get properly their share of the national income. What is it 200 or $250 a month a salary for a highly developed country like this, which they make billions and billions and billions of dollars? And that's the situation in. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to install hope to these people. And what kind of a hope? It's not the hope which is generated by human being. It's the hope of the scriptures. And I'm so happy to see that our tables, we have this very nice, this very nice uh, picture. That's the kind of hope we want to install. The Christian presence in this part of the world, how should I say it, so that politically it will be correct? It is tolerated. We have restrictions, but we have tolerance. And the degree of tolerance changes from one country to another country. Saudi Arabia is completely closed. Qatar with the Wahhabi regime. Wahhabi is one kind of a Sunni uh, religion. There are, we have a lot of restrictions. The other countries, the degree of tolerance changes. Fortunately, we have places like Bahrain, where Bill and Lorraine came. Bill and uh, Lorraine came. We have much better uh, uh, freedom. We have more freedom there. So the church is established in a compound which is given by the authorities and the church buildings are there so everybody goes and have their worship services. 
We are free to do whatever we want to do inside the church. But we need to be a bit careful as to what we want to do when we go outside. The, you know, like the little boys, the babies, I mean, you tell them, just stay here, don't go out. If you go out, you will be punished. So it's more or less the same procedure. And we, as a Bible study, we try to work within these church compounds, and we have established something like 18 different resource centers all around. What we do is we go and visit all these migrant churches. We have churches in the, in the region which composition is all migrant workers. And not all the migrant workers, they worship in church buildings. We have churches which is in the basement under a big building. And this is one of the pictures. A big number of them, they end up in a prison or safe house. What is safe house? Prison, you know what is prison. But what is safe house? Safe house is a place which is established by the uh, embassies where all these runaway mates, which cannot take the situation anymore, they run away from their homes because they have been to abuse and all sorts of things. Their passport has been taken from them. They have no place to go. They cannot tolerate anymore. They run away. No place to go. They end up in a safe house. And that's one of the... the this lady tried to commit suicide. She threw herself from a third floor. She didn't die. Her legs are broken, and I'm not sure if she will be able to walk. This is in one of the Christmas last year. We went and visited her, and this is what she said. I felt myself at home when you gave me a copy of the Tagalog Bible. We distribute Bibles in so many languages because we do have so many people, and this is very important. A Nepali guy was suffering from depression because of the pressure of the work and the condition in which he was living in. He said, the Bible changed my life. Almost 40% of these migrant workers are illiterate. So you give them the printed book, it doesn't help. So what are we going to do? We need to be creative so that we can help them to be engaged with the Word of God. But also, we need to encourage them in order to learn their mother language. And we have the literacy program also, besides other things. Storytelling. Yesterday, we had a very exciting session with the storytelling. That's one of the things that we are trying to do because we realized that especially among the migrant workers, storytelling is a very good avenue by which we can engage the scripture message. Okay, here we come to the Seven Star Hotel. Is there anybody who is complaining of Windham Hotel? <laughs> if there is anyone, I'm going to uh, take you to these labor camps. This is a place where all the migrant workers live. It's a place which is all around the city, different places. 400, 500 of, of them are packed like you pack it a uh, sardine. There's small, tiny, small box uh, rooms, which has almost like a box, four or five people in each and every room, and they live there. Sadly to say, one kitchen and one toilet facility for 400, 500 people. Imagine what does that mean? And what they do is they prepare their food for the evening and then for the next morning and for the lunch, and then in the evening they come and they repeat this. And what do they eat? Rice in the morning, rice at noon, rice in the evening, once a month meat, because that's all they can afford. And that's what we need to do. We have to go to the labor camps so that we can. And then we produce hope booklets or other kind of a scripture booklets so that we can help them to be engaged with the word of God. Of course, you also need to be involved in holistic ministry because these people, they go through a lot of other suffering. We come to the trauma healing. Okay, we'll stop for a minute now, half a minute. Why is it that I made this introduction? It's important. Why is it that I showed you some snapshots of the different programs that I have? In the Bible Society Global Fellowship, we used to translate the Bible, and we still do translate the Bible. We publish and print the Bible, and we still publish and print the Bible. And we distribute the Bible, and we still continue printing the Bible. But it came a time where we said translation is good, printing is good, distribution is good, but that's not enough. We need to be involved in what we call engagement. We have to have people in order to open the Bible and read the Bible in their own language and understand the Bible and make a meaning and nurture with that meaning and become new people. And all these different programs that you saw are geared in line with the engagement strategy that we've been following. And the Trauma Healing Ministry, which we recently started, it's been only a year, is also should be considered as part of the engagement program and for a number of reasons. 
Harriet and I, being good friends, we had a chat on the trauma healing uh, in one of these UBS meetings. She started talking to me about all that. So it was here, but not in the middle, somewhere in the back of my mind. Not Harriet, what she said in the back of my mind. Okay? I didn't forget, but it's not priority for me. Then, a year ago, uh, me and my uh, staff, Daniel, unfortunately he's not here, he sends his greetings, he was supposed to be here. We were in a supermarket, we were buying something, and all of a sudden a lady from the church came. And just in front of the supermarket, we met for one hour. You know, the important decisions are taking place in the very old places, let me tell you. In front of the supermarket, we started talking about, she said, we are ministering about migrant workers. Whenever we need Bibles, you're giving us the Bible. Whenever we, they need money, these people, we try to raise money. Whenever they need medical help, we find a doctor or a hospital. Whenever they need airfare ticket, okay, we collect. But we're coming across to situation of depression, abuse, pregnant women, they want to get rid of their kid. And that's something which is very common, sadly. We don't know how to deal with these issues. So what are we going to do? That's where I said, here comes Harriet. I said, I have a program for you. I have a program. She was so excited, so I went back to Harriet. And I told her, do you think you can contextualize trauma healing to our situation? Because I know you're very much involved in the Middle East, in Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, with all the refugees and so on. But our situation is not a war refugee. We have migrant workers, we are refugees. I said, of course. And that's how it started. And here, I want to acknowledge the great work of Bill and Lorraine for, uh, for taking their time to come to this unknown land of Bahrain and help us in developing uh, the initial stages of uh, the trauma healing. Bahrain is a small island. We started with Bahrain and for a number of reasons. Bill and Roren, you encouraged, you gave us not only the information, but you created a lot of enthusiasm in the leadership community of our churches when it comes to the trauma healing. And we're looking forward for the days to come. The, we had our first training meeting in February 2017, where 24 leaders from 10 different churches came together. And that's something which is very, very important for us. Because we have to work through the churches. That's the system. It can be that with other Bible studies, other organizations, it can be different. But for us, it is so crucial that we have to work. In fact, it is one of the main avenues through which we need to work. And you can see all the ministry areas, patients, victims, and so on and so forth. What are some of the... What happened? Oh! <laughs> some of the testimonies. I mean, you could read uh, what, uh, what the testimonies. I found the topic on domestic abuse very helpful. These are some of the participants. This is the first time that these people were being exposed to such kind of a program, you know? So you have to look at it from that perspective. And there is said, I'm so thankful to ABS through the BSG, Bible Society in the Gulf, has reached out to individuals like me. I have been looking for a course similar to this one in the last year, and my prayers was answered. And another testimony. And this one also. Let's talk about his personal. I think this testimony is equally uh, important because he's, it's, it's coming from a minister and how he is balancing his, his time between different ministry fields. So what we did after the conference. Okay, one of the other things which is very interesting, we created a WhatsApp group. Now, Bill and Lauren are on this WhatsApp group. I'm sure every day you're receiving because they are so excited that they are sharing their uh, uh, their uh, feelings and their testimonies, their experience. Al almost every day I, see, I receive a, a message on, on the WhatsApp. So we are having he healing sessions uh, over the last April, May, and June. You can see all the different churches, the facilitators that were trained during the conference, and the participants in each and every of these. And then another one in September, October. And eventually we had our second training, where again Bill and Lauren came in November. This is the advanced one. It was very interesting. We were supposed to have the same group being trained so that we can go one step further. And what happened? It's a word of the mouth, you know? This one says, wow, it's a great uh, training. Why don't you come in? So we ended up having seven new people. And again, thanks to Bill and Lorraine, who were creative enough to redesign the curriculum 
so that those who will be receiving the advanced training will receive it, and those who were first time comers again will be exposed. So that also was a very good session. Again, we continued after that. We're looking forward for 2018 and 2019. What we want to do during this time of the year is to encourage them to come out of their church constituencies and all the trainings that they are doing within their own churches in order to go into the field and start doing all this healing ministry. And we're looking forward that towards the end of the year, Bill and Lauren will come again. We need to sit down and talk about this so that we can do another advanced equipping session. And hopefully, hopefully, we will be able to identify one, two, maybe three master facilitators. And these facilitators will train the local people, but eventually we want to move on to another country in the Gulf. We don't want only to stay in Bahrain. We have a number of other countries, so we want to move to Kuwait in 2019. Last but not least, I'm on time, right? 11 seconds. I will do it. I was interviewing a young uh, Indian woman, a maid, in Dubai. And she is coming from one of these villages in India. By the way, these migrant workers, this whole package of misery is not only been accumulated in the Gulf. They already are carrying this misery with them from, from home. She was forced to get married at the age of 15. She had two kids. She has two kids. Her husband left her for another woman. And the poor lady, she has to make a living. So she left the two babies at home. She came to Dubai to make a living. And I asked her, how much money do you make? She said 900 dirhams, which is $200, $250. And I said, what are you doing with this money? She said, well, I have to eat, and the remaining will I have to send it back home. OK, $250. You have to eat with that, and the remaining you have to send there. So you visualize what does that mean, the remaining part. I said, how long has it been that you haven't seen your babies? She said, four years. And then she started talking to me about her experiences in Dubai. And being a woman, it was embarrassing for her to tell that she has been abused. But by one way or the other, she managed to tell me that, and she started crying. It was very difficult for me to resist my emotion because I was doing a scientific research and I had to be very careful. But then she whipped up her tears and she looked at me with some strange confidence with a smile on her face and she said, I am so thankful to our Lord for everything that he is giving to me. I said, hang on a minute, this is too much. I can't take it. What is it that she has to be thankful, this woman? Is it her salary? Four years, she hasn't seen her babies? The abuse? A husband who has left her? That's the kind of a change that this book provides, sisters and brothers. And then she told me, I'm praying so that the Lord will touch the heart of my husband, just like he touched my heart, so that he will repent and he will come back and join the family. I received my doctorate from New York Theological Seminary, but before that, I did my master's degree in agriculture. It has got nothing to do with theology. That was back in 1984. And right after that, I joined the Bible Society. It's been 37 years I'm with the Bible Society. Three, seven. And when I joined the Bible Society then, I was much older then. Now I'm younger, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> my friends were a bit skeptical with the choice of my career. They said, how come you do a master's degree in agriculture and you end up working in, an agri uh, in, a, in a Bible Society which has got nothing to do with agriculture? Today, and after all these years of my experience in the Bible Society, I feel that my friends were wrong and my choice of career is right. I didn't change my specialization. I am very much in the field of agriculture. We're planting. We're planting the seeds that will give new life. Wherever it will be, in the Gulf, 
or all around the world. That's our mission. And the trauma healing is one good avenue by which we can help people to have this new life in Jesus. Thank you. So this is Samuel. Samuel was born into a civil war in northern Uganda. Part of generational trauma he was born into, but not only born into, but brought into. Samuel, his father was killed the very day that he was abducted. His mother, his siblings, and himself were all abducted by the LRA rebel army in northern Uganda. Samuel would be forced to commit countless acts of violence. Not only was he violated himself, he was forced to perpetuate acts of violence. I'm sure you can imagine and have heard the stories of the shame and the guilt that comes from that. He was physically, psychologically, and spiritually tortured. I want you to remember his face. I'm going to go back real fast. And I'm going to um, glean a bit from Dr. Lyles and say, beneath the trauma and abuse, survivors still have dreams. So later in this presentation, we're going to bring you back to Samuel, because this picture was taken about five years ago. We're going to bring you back to Samuel today and what he's now doing. And this is Stephanie. Stephanie is a young mother who is violently and sexually abused. She has not sought care for the abuse that she has experienced. She has not worked through the trauma that she has experienced, and she exhibits the symptoms. She has complex PTSD. Some of those symptoms, which Diane did a far better job at defining than I'm going to do right now, um, if you were here on Tuesday, depression, dissociation, codependency, overparenting, transmitting her anxiety. This is where we're getting into the generational trauma. She is transmitting her anxiety to her child, Joseph, through the stories that she tells, through how she interacts with the world and the lens that she sees the world through. So what about Joseph, that son that I just mentioned? He has not been abused himself, but his world, his little world, is colored by the stories and the anxieties of his mother. He himself has started to exhibit the symptoms that we all know and associate with PTSD and anxiety disorders. So the question is, is Joseph then going to pass this down to a third generation, generational trauma? But my hope is that Joseph and many others like him will not, because they're going to interact with men and women like you who have devoted your life to stopping that cycle. There are millions of individuals that we have heard about just this week who are a part of cycles of violence. We heard about hundreds of years, 20 generations of uh, tr generational trauma within the Navajo culture and the Navajo people today. And that is just one of the many generational traumas that we face and that we get to be, thank the Lord, we get to be a part of changing. Okay, so let's not get stuck there Again, as Dr. Lyle said, there is hope and they dream. So there's two different types of generational trauma I wanted to touch on. I've got some definitions on the next slide. As Harriet mentioned, you will get these slides, so I won't bore you by reading those. So let's simplify them. Intergenerational trauma, think social groups. Go back to our presenter this morning with the Navajo people. Okay, this is going to be our intergenerational trauma. And I, even when I was working on this, I kept getting this mixed up, so I came up with something. Inter, think interstate, right? You are crossing state lines, crossing many social groups as you're driving. Okay, so when you think intergenerational trauma, think social groups. And intragenerational, that is your closed groups, that's family. So like Stephanie, the abuse that she experienced and the abuse, the transgenerational trauma that is now affecting her son, Joseph. So a couple of examples uh, that we've even heard about this week and others that I'm sure countless of you in this room um, are working with these populations, but genocide, loss of culture, extreme poverty, and the forcible removal from one's own culture, just as we just heard about. 
Other examples are First Nations groups. Hey, I didn't know that was going to be right before us. People of color and immigrants, resulting in historical unresolved grief, disenfranchisement, and internalized oppression, if not external oppression. And again, a couple of other examples. So intra, see, I'm even having to look up here. I'm getting inter and intra mixed up. So if you do, don't worry about it. Let's just call it all generational drama and make it nice and simple. So your classic example here is childhood abuse or the abuse that Stephanie herself went through. That is a closed system. So you, we see this in other types of trauma from extreme poverty, sudden loss and death, um, loss during war. So not only did Samuel, who I mentioned before, not only has he experienced and gone through uh, the intergenerational trauma, but also the intragenerational trauma loss of his father in the war. So I really feel like Dr. Uh, Costello here summarized very well. So I'm just going to read this. She stated it far better than I'm capable of. What is overwhelming and un unnameable is passed on to those we are closest to. Our loved ones carry what we cannot, and we do the same. Psychosocial legacies are often passed on through unconscious cues and effective messages that flow between child and adult. Sometimes anxiety falls from one generation to the next through stories told. And I do want to say that is unless there's intervention. That's why we're all here, because there's hope if there is intervention. And Jesus restores and redeems and can and does restore and redeem uh, these stories. So obviously, we did a little bit of research as we were leading up to this. And rather than just pulling out the, the usual stuff, here were a couple that we thought were unique. I'm going to jump to the second one, a study on mice published by the Journal of Nature and Communication suggests a positive stress coping skills of trauma might be passed down. That being, you went through trauma, you might have learned some positive coping skills that are actually gonna make you more resilient or make your children, that next generation, more resilient. This is something that we see in many of the youth that we have the privilege of serving. I, I used to ask why in the world are so many of the children that we have the opportunity to serve who have been born into war and have survived war, how are so many of them as resilient as they are, and how are so many of them leaders? They have had to become resilient. Their people and their families, they themselves, have had to become resilient, and unfortunately, many of those who were not as resilient are no longer with us. So I wanted to invite you to participate rather than me boring you to death and talking the whole time. But I would like really short answers here, 10 to 15 seconds each. If you go longer than that, Jared's got a buzzer for me, and he will buzz. All right, so 10 to 15 seconds. I would like for you to share, based on your experience, for the Samuels and the Stephanies and the Josephs that you have known and had the privilege of serving, what might their human experience be? I want to leave that very open their human experience. And you, you can grab a mic, you can say it, I'll repeat it. Their symptoms, their experiences daily. Fear, yes. Thank you. Anger. An altered worldview. Isolation, absolutely. What's that? Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. When I look at that picture of Stephanie and Samuel, both they looked overwhelmed. Shame, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, your body's breaking down. I won't keep referencing Dr. Lyles all day long. He talked about uh, premature death from adrenal fatigue and what the body physiologically goes through from this trauma. So maybe just one or two more. Low self-esteem, yeah. Someone else? Hopelessness, absolutely. Thank you for your participation. Oh, now it's your turn. So what do we do? You know, the stories that we have heard this week are so incredibly heavy, aren't they? Um, 
We have walked in deep, deep places of pain. We have walked amongst the dry bones. And we have asked the question, is there life here? Is it hopeless? And we would say, absolutely not. We believe from the deepest and darkest heartache can spring up the most beautiful, life-giving waters of healing. But it does not happen easily, and it actually does not even happen naturally. It requires hope, not a blind faith and not naive Christianese. It requires something bigger and someone bigger to look past the pain and look past the experience into what could be. True hope is choosing to believe that healing is possible, that God and time are amazing healers, and that we and those that we serve are not our traumas. We are not what we have done. We are not what has been done to us. We are not an experience that tried to break us. We are children of God, daughters of the King, sons of the king created in his image there's a saying that i love it's anonymous and i'm going to say it twice because i think it's so powerful never be ashamed of a scar it only means that you were stronger than what tried to hurt you never be ashamed of a scar it only means that you were stronger than what tried to hurt you so breaking the cycle, we believe it starts with stopping the bleeding of trauma. And the key to that is safety, finding a sense of safety in someone, a safe environment, a sense of safety to stop the bleeding of trauma. Number two, mending the wound, finding a safe place to voice our secrets, our shames, the pain that we have. That can be a person, that can be a healing group, hopefully that can be the church, a safe friend. And number three, changing the course. So we believe when you stop the bleeding and you start the mending, then you start to change the course of generational trauma. It's one of the reasons why we start with children of war. We believe when you start with the smallest child and teach them a different way, and help mend their wounds of trauma, then you can stop the cycle of war. So it also begins with us, right? Um, Dr. Gus Roman yesterday, he talked about how vital it is when someone like you takes time. That really struck me. You take the time to listen, you take the time to hope, you take the time to love. We are called to hope for those we serve when they cannot hope for themselves. So these are a couple of scriptures that come to mind when I think of the work that we all do. Isaiah 117, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of the orphan, fight for the rights of widows. Isaiah 61.1, bring good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom to the captives. And I just want to thank you all for a minute. I just want to stop every, everything and say thank you. Um, one of the reasons why I love coming here, and Matthew and I just love coming, we, we talk a lot, like, we, we say often that you are our people. So we, we kind of feel normal around you guys, and we don't feel normal around everyone, honestly. Um, but the world feels so small here. We throw around countries like we're talking about suburbs of Philadelphia, um, it, just in a, in a table that I was sitting at, I think there, was, there were maybe five countries represented in, in multiple continents. And so you all are not just changing the world through being the hands and feet of Jesus. You're actually changing hearts. And so I just want to stop and say thank you for that. So what we do, we'll tell you a little bit about what uh, the work that we do. Um, that meeting, Harriet, I think was almost 10 years ago. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, this is uh, our 10-year anniversary of, of the work that we do. Um, and man, I was just naive and green, but you just kind of learn along the way. Um, I was in full-time private practice at that time, 
but just really learning about what war really looked like for children of war. Um, so we had the opportunity, along with 50 nationals in Congo and Uganda, to work with hundreds of rescued child soldiers and children orphaned by war. So that's our target group. Um, and we focus on long-term rehabilitative care. Um, we're seeing a huge difference in these kids, and I think the main reason is because our, our team on the ground, they show up every week. So it's long-term rehabilitative care. We realize that this is not just a sprint, that it's a marathon when the trauma is so deep. You know, the world sees child soldiers and former sex slaves and children orphaned by war as hopeless. The world has actually really given up on them. We tell the stories of trauma, and like you, we probably get blank stares on the other end, like, whoa, that's too much for me to handle. Uh, kids as young as six are kidnapped. If they're too um, young or too small to carry guns, then they're placed on the front lines as human shields. The average age of a child in captivity is 12. The average years that they're in captivity is three years. Girls can be abducted to be wives, which really just means sex slaves. So they can have two to three babies in the bush, and then that becomes their life, because they think, how am I going to escape with two to three children now? Children are orphaned by war whenever rebels come into their villages, and everyone flees, and they never find their parents again. So they become street children. They're born into war and poverty and abuse, lack of education, a mindset of survival, being exiled from their homes, running from rebels, praying for food. But it didn't stop there because their parents were born into war, poverty, abuse, lack of education, had a mindset of survival, and were praying for food. And just in the past few months, the war in Congo has started to rage again. So the world would say that they are hopeless, and Jesus would say that they are the light of the world. With a plan not that they just survive war, but they can be thrivers. They can be the next Nelson Mandela's. That they're not just surviving, that they can be peace leaders in their communities in the name of Jesus, finding purpose in their pain. It's interesting, we don't actually use the term rescue child soldier or orphaned children in the work that we do in Congo and Uganda. We use the term young peacemaker and hope child. So the rescue child, child soldiers refer to themselves as, I'm a young peacemaker. And the orphan children refer to themselves as, I'm a hope child. So it gives them a new identity, which is so important. Diane talked, um, referred to trauma as an event a multifaceted part of life that can do multifaceted damage to the heart and the soul and the body. And so it takes a multifaceted approach to healing, mind, body, and spirit. As we talked about before, oh, I'm supposed to not talk so loud. No, don't talk so fast. Got it. <laughs> you can't keep up with the translation is what I'm understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, for such wounds to be mended, it will be a marathon, again, and not a race. Okay, I got a thumbs up. That's good. So we focus on healing spirits. Um, this is the first part of our work. We started here. Trauma healing, discipleship, peace building. Um, really, this was the focus when we started. And... Um, we realized that what happened is so many of these children, again, have been orphaned. So there was no one to pay for their school fees and no one to pay for their medical care. So their hearts started healing, which is wonderful, but the generational cycle of poverty was just going to continue because they would never be educated. So we started a sponsorship program offering education and also vocational training for those who couldn't go to school. So education, professional skills, and also leadership development. And then the third, healing of bodies. Again, when you don't have a caregiver or a parent, then there's no one to pay for medicine when you get malaria. We have a boy right now who has a, a brain tumor. 
And so there would be no one to pay for his surgery. He's in the hospital right now recovering. So the core of our work um, is what we call peace clubs or peace programs, and it's group work. So the, the groups meet anywhere between one and five times a week. Um, we have a three-tier curricula-based model. So the first part of that is trauma healing. The second part is conflict resolution and peace building skills. There's a curriculum for that. And then the third is leadership skills development. So what we're seeing again are the kids coming in very wounded, becoming healed, and then being able to dream of being peace leaders in their communities because of the skills that they've been able um, to learn. So discipleship, this is woven throughout everything that we do. The scripture, um, Ezekiel 36, 26, comes to mind every time I think of these, these kids. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give to you a heart of flesh. These kids don't just look at Jesus as their spiritual savior. They literally look at him as he saved me from death. He saved me from captivity. Uh, this is one of the peace clubs that we have. This is actually led by a graduate. Um, these are their first Bibles that they've ever received. These are Bible Society Bibles, so thank you, Congolese Bible Society, for those. And they're holding them up just because they're so excited to have their first Bible. Woven also throughout the program are the creative arts. And when you think of children, you realize that their language is play, right? And so using art and dance and drama and music is such a crucial part to bring them back to life again and also for them to be able to find a safe place to voice their story um, without words. So this is um, an art drawing. Matthew actually has one of um, another drawing. You can pop that out if you want to. He always keeps it in his pocket as a pocket square so that um, he can quickly just tell people about the kids' stories of redemption. So if you'd like to see that drawing, feel free to tap him on the shoulder. I'm sure that he would love to show it to you. This is a, a photo of a drama. The kids will often do dramas of um, being captured, their time in captivity. It's not this, this uh, young man made that gun out of wood and kind of corn shuck. And so they were re reenacting their time of captivity, but also their time of being rescued and coming into our program. So music is a huge part of the healing process. They love to write songs. They love to sing and dance. Um, they've also recently written a song using the kids' version of Healing the Wounds of Trauma. So this is, I think they've written two now for two of the chapters, and I have a video. I didn't know they were doing this. They do so much of this on their own, but here's a short clip. They're calling them healing songs. Give you a little bit of an example. <laughs> so hopefully they'll have a song for each chapter, guys. Won't that be fun? Um, I'll end with this, and then Matthew is going to come back up and share the rest of Samuel's story, the first boy that you saw the slide of. The gospel does not end with Jesus dying on the cross. The gospel is good because he rose from death to give us life. The enemy would have us believe that the stories that we have heard this week 
with trauma end with trauma. But Jesus says no. He says, I will make beauty from ashes. And we believe that our greatest heartache can become our greatest purpose because trauma does not have the last word. Hope does. How about more from Dr. Lyles? Save this one as a background on my phone so I'd remember to do this. Right, the human spirit is ultimately resilient in the face of trauma when merged with the spirit of God. Ah. <laughs> Oh, that was so good. Let's read that again. The human spirit is ultimately resilient in the face of trauma when merged with the spirit of God. And that's Samuel. You saw a picture of him from 2012 at the very beginning. And this is Samuel taken back around last August, September. Samuel is now finishing his degree in nursing. He has graduated from primary and secondary school. He is soon to finish his degree in nursing and is going to use those skill, skills to heal physical wounds. And I'm sure he'll do a bit of healing of spiritual and emotional wounds as well. He is an awesome young man. We are really proud of him. There's a couple of others I wanted to share about. Um, I'm going to change up the stories because I saw Alice in that video. Alice, the oldest young girl you may have seen in the one-minute clip, she will finish her degree in counseling this year, her university degree in counseling. She herself was once an abductee by the rebel army in Congo. Not only has she gone through healing the wounds of trauma, but other curriculum that Exile International utilizes, but she is apprenticing uh, under our female counseling staff, already working with and healing the wounds of trauma there at that counseling program and she will soon finish her degree, and I can't wait to see what she does, and I hope she accepts the offer when we extend the offer to hire her and stay on full time. Also reminded of Ishmael Bay, a friend of Bethany's, who is today a UN ambassador, was once a war-affected child soldier in Sierra Leone. He wrote a book that was a bestseller. Many of you may have read it. I believe it's the, the the Long Way Gone. If you have not read that, highly recommend it. It is heart-wrenching, yet also beautiful, because just like Samuel's story, it ends with hope. Ishmael talks about what changed his life was the first time people went from looking at him as murderer, and looking at him for the things that he had been forced to participate in, but someone believed in him. All of the individuals that you work with need someone to believe in them, need someone to bring them the good news that they can be a new creation in Christ. Because is that not what the word has taught us? They can be a new creation in Christ and that brings hope. We loved what Ishmael taught us about believing so much that every single child that goes through our program gets a really cool t-shirt and it says believe on it. And we explain Ishmael's story, and we make sure they know that the staff that are serving them love them and believe in them, that they have a Father in heaven that believes in them. And there are many others all around the world that are praying for them that believe in them as well. Okay, how about some table discussion time? We did pretty good on time. There's actually time for it. Okay, yeah. Can I ask Matthew and Bethany what, if they could comment on what they see are the factors that lead towards resilience and those that lead to the ones that they lose? Well, one uh, really sad response I have is I think some of the resilience we see is the resilient ones have survived, unfortunately. That's, that's one answer I would say. Um, the less resilient probably did not make it. Um, but then also, um, usually when we ask children, I'm going to answer it kind of, sort of, if you don't mind. So usually when I've asked children, because we don't facilitate the program day in and day out, our Ugandan staff are way smarter and absolutely more culturally literate than I am for their culture, and same goes for our Congolese uh, team. Um, but one thing I get to ask from some of the youth is just like, hey, tell me about your experience. 
and or hey, what has meant the most to you? And rarely do they say the counseling program. They usually say forgiveness. They say that Christ has forgiven me, and that understanding that they've gained, um, or the new creation in Christ, comes up often. And it's that kind of that light bulb moment of like, oh my gosh, I'm not just my past. I'm forgiven. I have this new opportunity. And I I feel like that hope that's instilled through that, through the foundation of Christ, um, is really where much of that resilience comes from. Um, Do you have anything to add? Yeah, the only thing that I would add is um, I think some kids and some adults are just naturally more resilient than other kids or adults. And it's part of it is just their makeup. Like I'm even thinking of friends and family I have. Some are just more resilient than others and probably they were born that way to a certain degree because they maybe have more of a fighting spirit than uh, a a spirit of victimization to a certain degree. Um, So we actually do talk about this a lot that when you are in, you know, you think of a, a 12, 13, 14, even up to 18 year old in captivity, if you have a fight to live, you're gonna find a way to escape if you can, you're gonna create a plan of, I'm gonna go, one of our kids went to get water, went to fetch water, and so that was that was how he escaped. Um, so that's just a small answer. Um, it's a tough question, by the way. Um, I will say one other thing is, also, given what they have survived, you've already, that's put into, per, put into perspective new, traumas that you experience or new hardships you experience. I remember several years ago, the the fighting was pretty bad around the Goma area, and it was all related to elections and riots because of the president postponing the elections yet again. Um, There were several days where we just couldn't even move around the city, and we were talking once we finally got back to the center. I was asking two of the youth in the program that are now university students, or were at that time, Um, and as uh, Augustine and John, I know that you'll never remember those names, but I need to say it for my own mental picture here. Augustine and John was like, hey, so what's the last couple days been about? What do you think about what's going on? And they both laughed and said, oh, (laughs) this is just joking. What do you mean? Like the violence, the riots, things like, oh, this is just, you know we were in the war, right? You know we were shot at. This, this, this is, is just joking. joking. So circumstances, perspective affects resilience. Yeah. Um, if there's no other, let's have Margie, oh, there is another question, yeah, please. Uh, repent. This might need to come. I have a very long, long story, but I'll tell it in two minutes. <laughs> uh, from 2005, uh, when we, we had our first peace, where we got the independence, <coughs> some families who are living abroad or in other areas, especially Uganda, Kenya, and even in Khartoum, uh, because since peace has come, they have to go back to their country, and they will not take their children with them. So it's kind of this separation because there's no, no infrastructure and schools, no good schools yet there. So the father has to go first and then arrange things there. So they left the mothers and the children uh, in their respective countries, like in Uganda, in Kenya, and so forth. So the challenge that happened, uh, the family become without uh, the head of the family. That's a challenge. And the father who stays there for long, he might think of, getting another woman in order to assist him. So this is one of the challenges that we we got. And there are so many families in Uganda now, or in Kenya. Uh, The wife is there with the children, but the father is there in Juba with another wife. So this also brought something in the family. And some reached the extent of not taking taking care of even those those who left, or he left behind like in Uganda, yeah. he's just busy with the new wife, doesn't have time for this lady who is stuck right here with the uh, child or with the children. And then those who came from Khartoum, so I was uh, actually stuck at the border because they were using this uh, water transportation. So when war came, some have not yet reached Juba, so they are stuck at the border there at Rang and Malakal, those areas. 
the families are already in Juba, and they are there, and they had no option to do the same, but to do the same as what happened in Uganda and Kenya. So they've gotten married to other women, and their children and with their women are here in Juba, messing up, doing a lot of things. And because of that, two things happened. We have a group called uh, Torontos, and then the Niggers. These are the children groups uh, that are doing a lot of atrocities in Juba today. You come from somewhere, you are fatherless, no food, no education, so you have to do something. So they become drug addicts, they involve in prostitution, and a lot of things. The Torontos grab bags when you're going on the road, make sure that you don't put your bag this side when this is the, 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 the passing side, you have to put it this way. You put it this side, someone called motorcycle and grab it and run with it away. So you have to make sure that uh, your bag is uh, really secured in a good place. Uh, the niggas uh, that are the killers. They kill. Mm. They gang rape. They do a lot of bad things at night. So the church is really overwhelmed. They cannot do anything because it needs uh, some uh, funds so that they can uh, assist that. Even the government is trying, but they are failing. So thank you very much. Well, yeah, you think of South Sudan. How many years has the war gone on there, or do, can we count? It, it's been wars on and off for how long? 21? Actually, from 1821. From 1821, to be precise. So you have an entire country with the children who are traumatized by war, by displacement. I worked with children in um, Goma with exiles, with your guys, uh, and with the Bible Society, and Debbie Wolcott was with us. But that was the, the most horrific thing, was these children had seen things no child should ever have to see. And we counted how many of them had, had fathers. You know, some of them had their mothers, but so many of them, their fathers were gone and just abandoned, just gone. And that was like a double, double, really like a real heartbreak. So, yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Nashat. I'm from the Palestinian Bible Society. Uh, this has been my first time to come here. Uh, it has been really enriching. Uh, but I also feel so much burdened for my nation now after I've learned all of these uh, new terminologies and uh, principles. And uh, I'm sharing this just for you to pray because uh, working with Palestinian people, you're working with a traumatized nation and you're talking about uh, all generations, from the older generation to the younger generation, even to the babies that are not yet uh, born. And um, uh, the question poses here, is there hope? Is there hope for uh, two million people living in Gaza who haven't come out of Gaza? It's like 270 square meters, big uh, prison or ghetto, if you like. And what is the role of the church there? Who The church itself is traumatized. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't uh, desire here to depress you with this, but I'm... I'm also hopeful only in prayers and in similar programs and adopting these programs and bringing some hope to people who are totally hopeless and living in despair. So pray with me as well for South Sudan, we've heard, uh, but also for the Palestinian people when you remember. Thank you very much. Eric.